Yeah, I'm reading your chat. That's what happens for me. It's like, who sent the link? Is it in my calendar? It's not in my calendar. Who's the person that's... <laughs> that's exactly right. Welcome to the Zoom life. I know. So I now stick in my calendar, if it's not a Zoom link, the email address that I need to go to. Like, I'm doing something with the uh, Department of Water Resources at a meeting next week, and I just had to email someone and said, who sent the email on this? Who sent the email on this? Who sent the email? Because there's four of them. And I can't remember any of their names and they're all handling different parts of it. Whereas Dan, you've been very good. It's been consistently Dan. <laughs> well, I don't represent an entire uh, bureaucracy, thankfully. It's just it's okay. you know, one department. All right, I think most of us have arrived by now. Um, welcome everybody to this week's uh, seminar. We have the pleasure of hearing from Rosemary Knight. Rosemary is a professor of geophysics at Stanford University. She's a leader in the field of hydrogeophysics, which uses a number of geophysical methods to study the hydrologic processes that occur in the top kilometer of the planet. Her most recent work focuses on integrating geophysical imaging, often with electromagnetic methods, with remote sensing data to be able to evaluate and manage groundwater resources, which is obviously a topic of great relevance here in California, and also a topic of research at IDPP as well. So without further ado, I'll turn the time over to Rosemary. Great. Well, thanks very much, Dan. And I'm sharing right, and you're seeing the slides, right? Good. Okay, well, thank you all. I'm delighted to be here today. I am going to be talking about earth imaging for groundwater science and management. So I always like to start with this view of our blue planet, just to remind us all of how essential water is for all life on the planet. But only 3% of this water is the fresh water that we and other living species need. And when we talk about fresh water, people often think of the water in the lakes and the rivers, the water, the surface water that you can see on the ground surface. Well, what I've been working on for quite a while now is groundwater. I use this schematic a lot, so this is just to introduce it. The tree is not to scale. It's a slice through the ground. And I'll be talking about subsurface regions down typically hundreds of meters. So the groundwater is the water that's held in those openings in the sediments and rocks below the ground surface. And it makes up 97% of all liquid fresh water. So many of us think of groundwater as our freshwater savings account. It's there to use if we run into trouble. If there's a drought, there's not enough surface water. We can always turn to our groundwater. And people have tended to assume that there's a vast amount of groundwater down there because we can't see it. It's easy to assume that. But increasingly with pressures due to climate change, population growth all over the world, people are starting to realize that our groundwater systems are in trouble, that this combined pressure means we have to start really thinking carefully about the sustainable management of our groundwater resources. So what do we do to move towards sustainable management of our groundwater? Well, first we need to understand the functioning of the groundwater system. We need to understand the processes that are controlling, that are governing, changes in the water quantity and the water quality. And understanding these processes is from my perspective at the heart of groundwater science and therefore foundational to groundwater management. 
You can't manage systems that you don't understand. So a lot of a lot of what we do in my research group is figure out ways of getting the data we need to really study these groundwater systems. And that's a problem that has motivated much of what I've done for the past 30 years. How can we get data about these systems? Traditionally, data have been acquired by drilling wells or for really shallow investigations, you can use a minimally invasive approach referred to as comb penetrometer testing, where you lower a rod into the ground with an instrumented cone tip. But both of these methods give you great information right where you drill, but you really don't know what's going on between your wells or below your wells, really not an adequate source of data for truly understanding water quantity, water quality, and the processes controlling that. I often compare the challenge we face in groundwater science and groundwater management these days to the challenge doctors faced at the start of the 20th century, when they also needed to see inside a region that they couldn't easily see or directly access. And doctors had their own form of drilling. It was called exploratory surgery. But then along came medical imaging. And medical imaging really revolutionized the way we study and manage human health. And my vision, my passion really, is to see earth imaging revolutionize the way we study and manage groundwater systems. Well, we can't exactly do this, but we have many different geophysical methods. And these are just the ones that we've worked with in my group over the years many different systems that we can use to image the subsurface. And I've started to adopt the term earth imaging as I've added satellite methods to what we're using. They're all really remote sensing methods, but it's a mix of what we would typically refer to as geophysical methods that are ground-based or airborne. And as I said, we're now using satellite methods. So I refer to all of these methods as earth imaging methods because they're allowing us to get the data we need about our groundwater systems. Now, I should make the point that most of these methods were not originally designed for applications in groundwater science or groundwater management. So a lot of the challenge or a lot of the fun has been figuring out how we can use these methods and acquire data, process data, invert data in new ways to figure out what's the most I can get out of these measurements to help me really understand groundwater systems. So today I'm going to be talking about three methods, the airborne EM method, a satellite method INSAR, and also a land EM method that's a towed EM system. Yes, that's me driving an ATV. So I'll be talking about examples in California where we've been using those three methods. When we look at California, the percent of fresh water that's used, 30% is what we used to say, that's in a normal year, it's 60% or more in a dry year. And we're moving away from referring to normal years in California with climate change. We're increasingly looking at extended periods of drought. So this is the framework for much of my research over the last 10 years, the idea that California is increasingly facing periods of drought. And another aspect that frames or another incident that frames my research is the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act by the California legislature in 2014. And this act says that all groundwater in the state must be sustainably managed. So how do we define sustainable? Sustainable was defined by saying you need to manage the groundwater so as to avoid all these things, avoid the chronic lowering of water levels, avoid significant and unreasonable reduction in groundwater storage, avoid saltwater intrusion, avoid degraded water quality, avoid land subsidence, and avoid an impact on surface water. So in California, I sense, I think many of us sense, a real sense of urgency. It's time to figure out these groundwater systems so that we can sustainably manage them. So with this real sense of urgency, it's a real opportunity for me to do exactly the kind of science I like doing, which is under the umbrella, I always say it's over my door, one day I'll put it over my door, this banner of knowledge into action. So the idea that you're doing basic research, advancing our knowledge of how to use these earth imaging systems, understanding the functioning of groundwater systems, but then you take that knowledge 
and you put it into action. And for me, that has meant working with local and state water agencies to try and advance how they're using geophysical methods for their groundwater management. So I'm going to start with my first example, and that's looking at saltwater intrusion along the Monterey coast. You can see immediately the problem. Here we have extensive agriculture on land, and in Monterey County, over 90% of the water is coming from groundwater for irrigation. 90% of the water for irrigation is groundwater. So here we are pumping all this groundwater on land that's inevitably drawing in the salt water of the immediately adjacent Pacific Ocean. This is a problem all over the world where we have coastal aquifers and half the world's population living within 60 kilometers of the coast. And for many of these people, groundwater is providing the water supply. And again, pumping groundwater draws in the ocean water. And on the other side, some of the richest ecosystems on the planet are found within a kilometer of the coast. So this groundwater through submarine groundwater discharge is supporting the functioning of coastal and marine ecosystems. So when we disrupt this balance and now we have salt water coming in instead of fresh water going out, not only is it making things very challenging for the humans who are trying to use the fresh water, it makes it very challenging for the ecosystems offshore who were previously dependent upon that supply of nutrients through submarine groundwater discharge. This is a simple schematic of what's going on along the Monterey coast. We have pumping from two levels. There's an upper aquifer and a lower aquifer. And over time, both have now been intruded. We think, we're not exactly sure where, with saltwater intrusion. And I say we think because there hasn't really been accurate mapping of the location of this saltwater freshwater interface. So there's some regions along the coast that have no salt water on shore at present, but they know it's out there somewhere approaching the shore. The data on land has been acquired by looking at well data. And this is mapping out where saltwater intrusion is presumed to exist in the upper aquifer, and this is using well data. And then in the lower aquifer, this is what the well data say, but the fact that we don't see any saltwater intrusion in these areas doesn't mean it's not there. It just means we don't have wells deep enough to monitor what's happening. There was an investment made in putting in sentinel wells along the southern part of the coast, sentinel being on the lookout for salt water. And what they were measuring in these sentinel wells or continue to measure is electrical resistivity. So electrical resistivity of an area depends upon the clay content, the amount of water in the material, and the salinity of the water. And so the interest is using electrical resistivity changes to monitor changes in salinity. As the concentration of NaCl or any salt goes up, the resistivity drops. So our idea was instead of depending on sentinel wells, let's use sentinel geophysics. So I coined this new phrase of sentinel geophysics. Let's get geophysics working along this coast to look for saltwater intrusion. And the method we decided to use was airborne, the airborne EM method. We'd first done electrical resistivity along the coast, but we wanted to cover a larger inland area. So the airborne EM method, your geophysical system is suspended beneath a helicopter. The system is held about 30 meters above the ground. And you can move at about 80 kilometers an hour. So you can cover 200 to 300 line kilometers in a day. The imaging depth, highly variable, depends on the electrical conductivity of what's down there, but typically you can see the depths of about 300 to 400 meters. So this is the system taking off. This was my first airborne EM survey. There's a large transmitter loop and it's current that goes through this transmitter loop that sets up a primary magnetic field. When you terminate that current, it sets up eddy currents in the subsurface. Those eddy currents set up a secondary magnetic field that's measured here at the receiver at the back of this loop. And so you're moving across the ground surface, acquiring these data. And if the audio was on, you would hear me cheering when it took off. So here is the airborne EM system heading off into the distance. What we're doing is making measurements that we then invert to obtain an electrical resistivity model of the subsurface. So wherever this helicopter goes, 
we have information about how the electrical resistivity is changing in the subsurface. The resolution of the electrical resistivity image that we recover through inversion from the data, about 40 meters horizontal resolution along the flight line, that's the footprint of an airborne EM sounding. The vertical resolution on the order of meters near the surface to tens of meters at depth. So we lose our vertical resolution at depth. One of the focuses of our research is figuring out how do we take that resistivity image and get back the information that we want about the subsurface. And in this example, I'm just going to be showing you how we extracted what information we could about salinity. So we're mapping out electrical resistivity. And what you'll see in the next few slides is resistivity displayed. And I'm showing as red, which is contrary to the color scheme I know most geophysicists use, but to me, red means bad. So wherever you see red, there's salt water. The lowest resistivity materials are sediments that are saturated with salt water. High resistivity, blue, fresh water. So blue is sediment saturated with fresh water. The dark, dark blue means very resistive. It's the unsaturated sediments right at the ground surface. Now, in this study, the data I'm showing you today, we were only able to say for sure we have salt water here, for sure we have fresh water here, because in between it gets much more complicated. As the electrical resistivity decreases as I move to a different area, so the colors you're going to see in here can either mean there's more clay there or it can mean the salinity is increased. So interpreting the data in this zone is very challenging and what we're doing is to work with modeling of saltwater intrusion along this area, which constrains both the model and the interpretation of the airborne EM data. But today for this study, I'm just going to show you the data, which was phenomenal. So this is the electrical resistivity data that we acquired over this section of coastline along Monterey Bay. I think it's about 50 kilometers along the coast here. Here's the city of Marina. This contour that you'll see is the contour of the well data saying where we would expect to find saltwater intrusion. But here, bright red along the coast, salt water right at the coast. And this limits the depth to which we can see. So we can't see below here. All these cylinders are the airborne EM soundings. So everywhere you see a cylinder, that's where we've measured resistivity down to a depth inland here, more like 200 meters. And at the ground surface, you can see the very resistive dry sediments. And as we start slicing through this, you see the spectacular, I mean, I was thrilled when I saw these data. Here's our classic saltwater intrusion wedge as we slice through the data set and this overlying fresh water. And what we were able to discover here was we have salt water clearly far inland in the upper aquifer, but we see much more detail than they saw in the well data. And there's zones where they had found salt water in the lower aquifer, and it was a real puzzle because there wasn't salt water intrusion at the coast. Well, what is happening is the clay layer they assumed was stopping the downward migration of the salt water is not. So we have salt water punching through into the underlying zone. So these data were collected in 2017 and the water agency went back last year and acquired another set of data. So we're in the process of pulling all these data together with a saltwater intrusion model. And really exciting, we're working with Kerry Key, putting a proposal together to go offshore here using the Scripps EM system to uh, go around Monterey Bay, because there's areas to the north where they still have fresh water on shore, but they want to know how many years do they have before they have this kind of problem in their area. Okay, so I'm now going to jump into the Central Valley. So move into the Central Valley of California. Here's Stanford, here's the Central Valley. We've been doing a lot of work in the San Joaquin Valley, which is the Southern part of the Central Valley, which is ground zero for everything that can go wrong if you don't think carefully about what you're doing with your groundwater system. The San Joaquin Valley, extensive agriculture. These are rows of almond trees and this system is, this agricultural system is highly dependent upon irrigation. There's not enough precipitation not to have irrigation. 
And the irrigation water, first of all, comes from snowmelt in the Sierras, that's then delivered through a series of aqueducts, canals, irrigation ditches, and secondly, from groundwater. And as we lose the snowpack, as we go through these periods of drought, increasingly, they are pumping groundwater. There's many problems in the San Joaquin Valley, many problems with communities, underserved communities that are scattered throughout this agricultural land. So here you have a community with all this pumping of groundwater going on around them, as you can imagine, their wells are going dry and there's problems with contamination of their wells due to the fertilizer that's put on all these lands surrounding them. So a lot to do in this area. And I'm going to be talking today about what we're doing focusing on groundwater quality using INSAR, Airborne EM, and a TOAD EM system. I mean groundwater quantity, what did I say? The focus is on groundwater quantity. Well, the first thing I'm going to talk about is INSAR, which started working on INSAR about six years ago. And when I still put this slide up, so it's an old slide, but it still amazes me that we have satellites going around measuring deformation with an accuracy of millimeters to centimeters. The data have been available since 1992, but are getting better all the time. Early data, the sampling was about once a month. Now we can typically get INSAR data, so deformation measurements every six to 12 days. And the spatial resolution, so this isn't the footprint of the SAR measurement, but by the time you account for decorrelation in the data and do the spatial averaging you need to, I would say we're getting areas where we estimate deformation with a resolution of tens to hundreds of meters. This is showing what we can see in the San Joaquin Valley with these INSAR data. So these are the Sentinel data. These were processed by TRE Altamira. And between January 2015 and September 2019, the total subsidence was 1.3 meters. So the land is going down about 26 centimeters per year. And I'm sure many of you have seen that old slide from the USGS showing subsidence in the Central Valley. It was 26 centimeters a year back then. It's still 26 centimeters a year. We're not very slow to learn. So this clearly shows a groundwater system under stress, over pumping, water levels going down. And that is what's causing this subsidence. There's also a huge impact on infrastructure. Many of these aqueducts and canals that are supposed to be moving water across the ground surface, we now have water going uphill because of the differential deformation that we've seen. So what we want to do is to use the INSAR deformation measurement to model and monitor the groundwater system. So we want to use this deformation that we can now map out with the INSAR data to figure out what's going on in the groundwater system. What's the link between this deformation, groundwater flow, and water levels? Well, not going to go through much of the background, but most of what we're seeing, most of the subsidence and most of the uprise, except it's been subsiding in California for the last 65 years, so I won't talk much about what happens when it goes up. So the majority of the subsidence comes from the compaction of clay layers. So even though we're pumping water from an aquifer system, there are so many of these fine clay inner beds. And when we drop the head in the aquifer, and when you pump, the head is just a measure really of the level of water in the aquifer. Dropping the level of water, dropping the head, is what triggers everything else that happens. Changing the head out here in the coarse grain materials causes the head to change in the clays, causes the clays to dewater, and that's the source of the compaction. I panicked for a minute. I didn't have an extra delta H here. So it's really what's happening in the clays. This, chain, this delta B is the compaction in these clay layers that's driven by the diffusion of this head change through pumping into the clay and then the skeletal storage coefficient of the clay itself. And the initial thickness of the clay determines the magnitude of the compaction we see. So because the head has to diffuse into the clay for this to happen, this, also, this process all de also depends on the vertical hydraulic conductivity of the clay. So we're pumping the water from our aquifer system. It triggers these head changes compaction and therefore subsidence of the ground surface occurs. So if we wanna use this deformation in the INSAR, I use my hands a lot, sorry. So if we wanna use this deformation in the INSAR data, 
to really figure out what's going on in the groundwater system. It's important to realize that delta H is driving the system, the pumping, the head change, the water level change. That's what's driving the system. But in order to understand the magnitude and the timing of the deformation, in order to link it to groundwater flow, we need to understand the detailed subsurface hydrogeology because it's where those clay layers are. What's the connection between this part of the aquifer and that part of the aquifer? That, we first need to unravel that before we start working with this to figure out what's going on. So focusing on a part of the San Joaquin Valley, we've been working in the Cahuilla Subbasin. So it's around the city of Tulare. So this is the Cahuilla Subbasin. And there exists in this area a groundwater model. The red outline is shown here. And there's two reasons why we're working in this area. One, there's a lot of subsidence. There's a great signal to work with. But two, and probably more important, I have the most amazing, I call them my real world partners, people in the real world with real problems in real places. So my real world partners, the local water agencies have been fantastic and have provided us with the well data we need to really figure out what's going on. And also every time we meet with them, we see something over here that we can't understand and it's, oh yeah, Joe, whatever his name is, opened his irrigation canal at the wrong time that year. So there's a big flood of water that you'll see. Anyways, it's just great working with, I love my local partners. So here's the Sentinel data. Here's the INSAR data. Here's my Kauia area. And this is again, looking at the deformation in this area. And you can see a lot of the maximum subsidence is happening right in this Kauia subbasin. But there's parts of the Kauia subbasin that have very low subsidence and fall outside this bowl. Also available for what we're doing here, we have NVSAT data that was earlier in time and ALOS data. So because we want to work with these INSAR data, but because I said, until we understand what's going on in the subsurface, we really can't figure out what's happening in these data. What we did was to fly our airborne EM system. We acquired airborne EM data all along these lines. Now the gaps in the airborne EM data are because you're not allowed to fly over urban areas. There is a non-zero risk that this system will fall off. So that's part of the reason you can't fly over urban areas. There's also interference from power lines. And so you get increased interference over urban areas, but flying over power lines out in rural areas is fine. You might lose one sounding if you go right over a power line. So in this study, we were acquiring the data, but we were really motivated to think carefully about how we were inverting the data to get the electrical resistivity model. There's sort of standard ways of inverting data that people tend to use, but what's happening in our research, the more we work with these groundwater managers, the more we try to figure out what's happening in these groundwater systems, the more we're being motivated to go back to the beginning and rethink the whole airborne EM method. We've started acquiring data differently and we are certainly inverting data differently. And it's this whole idea of thinking exactly what you, thinking about exactly what you wanna get from the data and then tailoring or designing your inversion to extract that information. So when we were working in this location, we first focused on getting information about the large scale structure of this aquifer system. And here I'm showing the inversion of the data using a conventional form and what we call a target inversion. But first, what I'm showing are the data. The color scheme here is the resistivity. So red, yes, I've changed my color scheme, but red is bedrock, it's the resistive material. The yellowy orange stuff is sand and gravel. So here's yellowy orange over here. The blue is clay dominated. So here's a lot of clay here. And we're looking down about 250, 300 meters below the ground surface. And this is a 40 kilometer stretch through the Cahuilla subbasin going from the Sierra foothills. So here's the bedrock of the Sierras out into the valley. And what we want to map out is first of all, the topography on the bedrock surface. We also want to map out a clay layer that plays a really important role in the hydrology of the system. It's called the Corcoran clay layer. And we also want to figure out where these low permeability set, where these clays are coming in. Oh, and I forgot to mention green. It's just like if you mix 
yellow and blue, you get green. So if you mix sand and gravel with clay, you get green. So the green says, these are packages where we've got sand and gravel, but a lot of these clay interbeds. So the top shows you what you get through a conventional inversion. So like an L2 norm inversion. And you can see we can't really get the accurate thickness of this clay layer. What we get makes it look much thicker than we know it really is. And it's because of the blurring that will happen. Instead of being able to capture this abrupt change in resistivity going from the upper aquifer into the clay, it's smeared out. Similarly, the top of the bedrock, we couldn't get it to the level of accuracy that we actually needed, nor could we clearly identify the top of this clay layer. So we've done what we're calling a targeted inversion. The paper's being submitted to WRR. Happy to send a um, early version to anyone who wants it. And we're adopting what's called an LP norm inversion, where the exponent on your smallness and your spatial constraints, instead of being a two in the LP norm, you allow that exponent to vary. And by varying that exponent, you can incorporate prior knowledge. Specifically, you can incorporate, I am looking for an abrupt change in resistivity, and I am looking for a narrow range of resistivity values in this area. So all to say, by taking on a new way of inverting the data, we got a fabulous resistivity image that allows us to map out where the Corcoran clay is, where the bedrock surface is. And we were able to start building a large scale structure of the groundwater model. We were able to clearly or very accurately map out the topography on the bedrock surface. We were able to map out the extent and thickness of this Corcoran clay layer. And we were able to start getting information about these impermeable sediments. How we've also used this large scale structure is to then do a structurally constrained inversion. And people have done this by using seismic data to map out the large scale structure and then inverting their airborne EM data. Well, what we said was, we're going to get the large scale structure nailed down, and then we are going to invert the data, constraining it to put in place that large scale structure. And what that does it gives us highly improved accuracy of mapping out the resistivity variation in the smaller scale structure. So it helps us better define this new zone of impermeable sediments that we're looking at. It helps us better resolve the resistivity variation that we know is telling us something about where the clay is, where the coarse grain materials are. Okay, so we now have this great resistivity model what we really want is sediment type. We want to be teasing out where's the sand, where's the clay, where are those clay inner beds that are really responsible for our subsidence? Where's the connectivity between this coarse grained unit and this coarse grained unit? And so the way we go from resistivity to sediment type, we've stuck with a method that was first published in this paper in Groundwater and a book chapter that we have just published really describes something that I've been passionate about for many years. And that is when we go from resistivity to something else, whether it's sediment type, water content, salinity, we should not be using the results that you get in a laboratory. The resistivity that you measure on a package of sediments in the laboratory is going to be very different than the kind of resistivity values you get when you're averaging over a large volume of the subsurface, the whole way in which you measure resistivity. In fact, I was chatting with someone the other day and this chunk of the subsurface that's heterogeneous, the resistivity I measure using an airborne EM method is actually different from the resistivity I measure using electrical resistivity measurement. So you have to do your rock physics experiment. You have to understand, you have to develop the transform between resistivity and what you want in the field not in the lab. The lab's useful for giving you an idea of what should happen. So what we're saying now is we do the experiment in the field. We fly over wells that have high quality lithology information so that we know, okay, there's clay here, there's a mixed unit, there's sand and gravel here. And we want to determine what the resistivity values are of these materials so that we can turn our electrical resistivity map into a map of sediment type. So the experiment I'm going to do, I'm not going to take this chunk into the lab and measure resistivity. I've got a resistivity measurement. So everywhere where I have lithology measurements, I'm going to use the resistivity that I measured with the airborne EM. 
And there is a mathematical relationship between the resistivity of those individual components and the resistivity that I measured. And we get at that relationship just by modeling the actual measurement, which is very simply applying an electric field parallel to these layered sediments. And so working with all the data available, we used a bootstrapping approach. You put all the data together, and this is the sort of map, or this is the sort of histogram you come up with. Here is the electrical resistivity of the sand and gravel in this area. And it's exactly what you would expect. It's not a single answer. It varies because the sand and gravel has variable porosity. It can vary in terms of details of the mineralogy. Here's the variation in resistivity values that correspond to clay. And here's this mix zone, which you can see is kind of overlapping the sand and gravel and the clay. So I now know in interpreting my resistivity data, any resistivity values out here, sand and gravel, any resistivity values over here, clay, in between there's some ambiguity. One of the things we learned very early on that is so obvious in retrospect is the relationship between resistivity and sediment type is going to be very different below the water table than above the water table. And this makes a big difference in California where the water table can be you know, 100 meters below the ground surface. A lot of the airborne EM methodology was developed in Denmark. Any of you have been to Denmark, the water table is usually at the ground surface. So they have one transform between resistivity and sediment type. What we found was we need to calibrate. We need to do this for above the water table and below the water table, wherever we are, because obviously water content is shifting our resistivity values and also broadening the distribution. Above the water table, sand and gravel can be anything from full of water to dry. And the clay can be everything from full of water to dry. And the resistivity will vary with water content. Once you get below the water table, everything's filled with water. So what I'm going to show you is how people typically work with transforms such as this. We interpret and display the most probable lithology. So any resistivity values in this area have been converted to sand and gravel. Resistivity values here are mixed. Resistivity values here, clay. And here is the final result from the Kauia subbasin. And believe me, I am still thrilled with this result. So what you're looking at, it's a fence diagram. So these are the lines along which we acquired our airborne EM data. And you're looking down 300 to 400 meters. The color scale, so red here is very resistive. This is the bedrock of the Sierras coming in and underlying the valley sediments. And because there's a fault along here, very quickly drops below the imaging depth as we move out into the valley. What we found is that there's a package of impermeable sediments up against the bedrock along much of this interface, which has important implications for groundwater moving from the Sierras into the valley. As you move out into the valley, here's the sand and gravel, these reds and oranges, much more sand and gravel in the upper aquifer. Here's the blue. Here is the Corcoran clay that everyone wants to map out because it's blocking hydraulic connectivity between the upper and lower aquifer, which has implications both for groundwater and also for what we're seeing in the INSAR data. And here's the lower aquifer showing up as green because there's sand and gravel, it has to be people pumped from there, but there's a lot of interlayered clay. So this is just, um, I was thrilled, 40 kilometers across. And here's the subsidence. Underlying it is the edge of the subsidence bowl. And here's what the groundwater managers thought was the extent of the Corcoran clay. And we have dramatically improved for them the estimation of the extent of the clay. So in progress, what we're working on is integrating the INSAR and the airborne EM data sets into the groundwater model so that we can truly use these two data sets together to understand processes controlling what we're seeing in terms of groundwater flow and head levels, changing water levels in the Korea area. What we have completed through integrating these two data sets is a 1D compaction model so that we know the link between water levels and subsidence at one location. And this was a model that we developed calibrating with INSAR data and leveling data. And this effort was led by Matt Lees, the paper recently submitted to WRR. So a bit complicated, focus on the top panel first. This is showing 
the head levels. So the water levels in the upper aquifer and the lower aquifer going back to 1950. So Matt did an incredible job, of sort of a detective thing. You start here, you spread out, you search for, I don't have time to go into all the details, but basically we've got 75 years of head now. So this is what is going on in the upper aquifer. This is what is going on in the lower aquifer. And down here is our subsidence model. And what's shown is the mean of all our model results because there is considerable uncertainty in some of the parameters in the model. We go through this whole calibration process, so have a range of model predictions. But what you can see is we're truly capturing what you would expect to see. Back in the 50s and 60s, people were pumping like mad. Head levels were going down in the upper and lower aquifer, high subsidence rates. The subsidence rate then stabilized through the 70s and 80s. And this is because all the surface water delivery came on board. So suddenly people didn't have to pump, didn't have to pump groundwater. Surface water from the north was being delivered to the south. But it's interesting to note the subsidence never stopped. There is nothing in the last 65 years that goes below zero. So we then go through a period of drought. Subsidence picks up again. We then go through to 2000 where it stabilizes and now we've got these periods of droughts where subsidence is just popping up and down. Some important things we've learned from this model, when you look back over time, you can now figure out how much of the subsidence prior to the 1980s came from the lower aquifer, about 70%, 20% from the upper aquifer, very little from the Corcoran clay. And over the last 20 years, 90% of the subsidence is due to pumping in the upper aquifer, much in the lower aquifer, much less in the upper aquifer or the Corcoran clay. But probably the most impactful result is we're able to show that the subsidence that's occurring in 2017, 70% of it is due to recent head changes. 30% of the subsidence in 2017 is due to head changes in the past. And this is the role of that delayed subsidence as your head diffuses into your clays. So this says if the groundwater managers stopped pumping today, just stopped those head levels, they think it's going to stop subsidence. No, they're going to continue to go down. And none of the sustainability plans submitted to the Department of Water Resources have accounted for this. They think if they stop, Everything's stabilized, it's not right. Okay, so fundamentally, why do we have this problem? Because water out is greater than water in. And we're doing a lot of work now to understand and hopefully supplement the poorly understood recharge component in the water budget. Water out is due to pumping. Water in is this recharge, this restoring the water in the groundwater system. And the question is where and how is that recharge taking place? And we've now got Wes Neely joined us at Stanford. So we're starting to use some INSAR data to look at recharge, but I won't be talking about that today at all. This is showing the snowpack in the Sierras from remote sensing data. And these data were provided by the group at, at UC Boulder. So what we have is we have snowpack in the Sierras and that is really the source of much of the recharge that's happening in the valley. Some of the recharge happens because the snow, when it melts, moves out into the valley through natural rivers, and I say natural, they're all dammed, <laughs> through rivers and streams and through aqueducts. And none of these rivers and streams and irrigation canals and irrigation ditches are lined. So there's a lot of distributed recharge that can be happening as this water is delivered across the valley. But what we're really interested in is mapping out where there could be significant recharge happening right along the edge of the Sierras as these rivers and streams enter the valley and encounter coarse grain sediments. So last year we flew the Sierras. This was a fabulous survey. I had a lot of fun with this. So we flew the foothills looking for recharge locations and this is just being written up. I think you're the first group to see it. This is thrilling. So my color scheme, purpley now is the bedrock all along the Sierras. And then we were looking for where we thought there could be these thick packages of sand and gravel. And here, 
which Graham Fogg's student about 20 years ago said there is bound to be a thick package of sand, gravels, cobbles even, coming off where the King's River comes into the valley due to this paleo channel that was created at the end of the last glacial period. There was this deep valley carved as the glaciers melted. They piled this cobble and gravel. And look at this, it's just phenomenal. This coarse grained fast path that reaches from here out into the Central Valley. Now, the extent to which this is being used for natural recharge is not clear at this point. But we are now discussing using these locations as managed recharge sites where we collect water, any a water that's available. It could be flood water, it could be a year where there's some excess surface water. And we put it on these coarse grain materials and get it into the subsurface. And this whole idea of managed aquifer recharge is becoming very popular in the Central Valley, where you capture and its mar, and people call it flood mar because the first idea was we always use flood water, but now it's like, let's use any available water. And you have, for example, empty recharge basins, or you use farmer's fields, almond groves, it's called on-farm recharge. And the big challenge is figuring out where to put this water, because you want to put this water somewhere where you know there's a sand and gravel pathway is going to move it to depth. If you flood a farmer's field that's full of clay, they're not going to be, it's not going to be full of clay, otherwise they wouldn't be farming there. But if there's a lot of clay, it could back up and then you've flooded this field and it can damage the crops, it can cause your almond trees to blow over. So to get this adopted, we really need to start mapping out what's going on at these sites. Airborne EM gives us some information, but what we're using is this toad EM system because we can drive up and down between the rows of almond trees, and that's what we've done. And this is the kind of data that we get. We're able to look below an almond grove and map out where the sand and gravel pathways are. So flood here, it'll go down to the water table. Flood here, it looks like sand and gravel at the top, but you're just going to land on a thick layer of clay. Now, Dan, I promised I would put this uncertainty stuff in, but I'm going to talk to you later because I stuck them in at the last minute, but I knew I would run out of time if I tried to do it. Because I do want to finish with this. Um, this is a passion of mine, knowledge into action, doing the science that can then be picked up and have an impact, help us address important societal issues. There is an urgent need in California. We've got 43 high priority groundwater basins. Those basins are in serious trouble. The medium priority are in trouble too. So 127 of our groundwater basins, 96% of California groundwater is deemed to be in serious trouble. We need to do something about sustainable management. And they have management plans due. Well, in 2016, I collaborated with Paul Goslin, a water manager in Butte County and Graham Fogg at UC Davis and sent a white paper to the governor's office and we said, look, we need to do things differently. California has entered, embarked on a historic journey to achieve groundwater sustainability. We said, there's this airborne EM method. We should be using it. We took the groundwater basins. We drew lines on this figure. We said, we can do this. We can cover with 20,000 lines, 20,000 line kilometers of airborne EM data, spend $10 million and you can do it. Well, Skipping to the present, because I then ran a two-year pilot project, but the California Department of Water Resources has launched a $12 million four-year project they're doing this. So it's absolutely thrilling, and it's a message to me and to all of you that we can make a difference like this. It's time to, for me, it was driving to Sacramento. I don't think I'd ever been to Sacramento before, but it was making the effort to go to the governor's office, go to DWR, go to the state board, and tell them that, look, as geophysicists, we have a better way of doing this. So knowledge into action. This is really my call to action to all of you geophysicists out there. There is an urgent need for sustainable groundwater management. For geophysicists, we can look at this as an incredible opportunity. Like we're gonna be getting such a stream of airborne EM data, and it's going to allow us to use our INSAR data in new ways. It's an incredible opportunity, but I always say, it's more than an opportunity, it's truly a responsibility. We have the knowledge base, we have the skill set, and I'm someone who believes that with knowledge comes responsibility. And it's time for us to truly step up to the plate
and help address this urgent need for sustainable groundwater management. So finished to acknowledge the funding, everything from the Bo Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation that's funded a lot of the Airborne EM, Almond Board of California, they're very interested in the more applied site scale work. And then of course, why all this happened is because I have an amazing group of students, postdocs, research scientists, collaborators out there, my real world partners, and I will finish with that. Thank you all. Thanks, Rosemary. That was really great. Um, we have time for questions. So um, if anyone would like to ask a question, you can just raise your hand on Zoom um, or you can put your question into the chat. Uh, Tinza, would you like to ask the first question? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Rosemary. That was really great. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm a little bit confused over why clays are um, um, uh, relatively conductive or has uh, low resistivity because as you, as you said, uh, they are, so they are, they have very low permeability. That means it's very hard for water to move through them, but then why they have high, resist, uh, sorry, low resistivity. That is a great question that I glossed over. So there are two mechanisms that control electrical resistivity through sediments. One is through the water in the pore space. And there you would expect high permeability materials to have high electrical resistivity because you could think that the current path is taking the same current uh, taking the same path as the fluid path. You're exactly right. And in materials where that is true, you can use measurements of electrical resistivity as an indication of low electrical resistivity. Well, you know what I'm trying to say: permeability and resistivity. You get good current flow. You get good fluid flow. Clays are unique in that they have a high surface area. And the surface area of clays, if you look at clays in detail, it's like sheets in a book. And all those surfaces have cations associated with a electrical imbalance in the clay structure. Those cations become a conductive pathway that acts in parallel to this pathway through the bulk of the pore fluid. So if you have a lot of clays present, current just shoots through that connected pathway along the clay surface. And you can get very high electrical conductivity because of those clays. So then high electrical conductivity means low permeability in materials where you have clay. But there's two different mechanisms. One is the ionic conduction through the, through the body of the pore space. The other is this cation fast path along the surfaces of the clays. I see. And in that case, um, in, the, in the case of clays, uh, the current, I mean, the electric current will flow uh, along the, the surface of exactly. the clay sheets. Exactly, yes. I see, great, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, please. Thank you, Rosemary, that was just fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask a, a really IGBP kind of style question, which was about your, your, your variable norm models uh, specifically. Um, how the choice is made between, let's say, an L2 or a, um, one of the lower p values. So what you showed us, it looked like your target um, uh, inversion was an L2 norm on the right side and then something, a lower norm on the left. Is that an automated uh, choice? How do you do that? Okay, so what we did, I skipped over part of the targeted is we first inverted the area where we had the Corcoran clay. Then we inverted the area where we had the bedrock. And what you saw in the end was those two inversions stitched together. So as opposed to doing what I would say is a compromise inversion where you set your exponent, your p-value and invert the whole thing, we said, first, we're gonna invert the Corcoran clay. And what we're going to use here is we change the p-value on the smoothness constraint so that, the smallness constraint, so that instead of having a Gaussian distribution of resistivity values, we said, we expect there to be a spiky distribution in terms of resistivity values because there's not going to be much variability in resistivity values in this clay. We then changed our spatial constraint to say, we do not allow for any kind of smooth, oh, I'm mixing things up. Anyways, so we then said there needs to be an abrupt change in resistivity across that interface. And that requires a lower p-value to only allow for resistivity changes where you really need one to fit what you're seeing. So this abrupt change from an upper aquifer to the bedrock 
it forces not to have a gradual change in resistivity, but only impose a resistivity change when there's a sufficiently large resistivity contrast. Uh, got it. So you chose your p-value a priori to be lower and then yes. do the inversion there. Got it. Yes. So Thank we you. set the p-value given what we thought, given what we knew about the target. Thank you. Uh, Gigi? Uh, hi, uh, thank you for your talk. I, I really appreciate it. And actually, I have two questions about the modeling. And the first question is, uh, I just wonder, as you build up the model, do you consider the topo topography effect? And another question is, uh, how do you know the uh, vertical resolution in, in your model? Thank you. So first of all, the topography effects. So that's taken care of in the processing of the data. So when the airborne EM data are acquired, there is an altimeter part of the system so that we always know the elevation of the airborne EM data and then using a digital elevation model. So you do have to account for the distance between and that we deal with in the processing of the data. And so then the vertical resolution, the vertical resolution, we are not doing an accurate assessment of the vertical resolution of the data. The way we invert the data is to set our resistivity cells so that the thickness of the resistivity cells increases by 10% with each layer as we go with depth. Vertical resolution though becomes incredibly important when you're actually talking to groundwater managers. And so what we do to complement any model such as this that we might present is a model where I was talking to Dan earlier we generate many, many, many models that fit the data. Up in Butte County, we generated 6,000 resistivity models. We used the posterior sampling to generate, we did six different inversions, posterior sampling, 6,000, actually 6,006 resistivity models. And then in each cell, we can show them where we have high level of uncertainty in terms of sediment type, low level of uncertainty. And in terms of vertical resolution, what we actually do is for each depth, we show them, we plot for them, given the resistivity structure that we've solved to recover through our inversion, how thin would a clay, how thick does a clay layer have to be for us to see it? How thick does a sand layer need to be for us to see it? So we do that at specific locations as a way of quantifying vertical resistivity. Because that is, I mean, vertical, vertical resolution, because that is the resolution they care about. Are we missing thin clay layers? Are we missing thin sand layers? And so we're now talking about resolution by focusing on what they want to resolve at depth and figuring out how thick those features need to be for us to be able to resolve them. OK, I see. Thank you for the answer. So a lot of what we're doing is targeted, focused on the answer, and um, setting it up that way. If there are no other questions, I definitely have a question, though we could talk about it offline if you'd like, Rosemary. I was sort of wondering, how were those, those 6,000 models uh, generated? That's sort of my question. So varying what we used for a starting model, varying the constraints on the inversion. So one of the models, for example, we had um, electrical, a good electrical resistivity log. And you know, there's a lot of debate as to whether you should incorporate prior information like an electrical resistivity log, or if you should leave it out to assess your answer in the end. And my attitude is if you've got data, use the data. So we used the good electrical resistivity log. So that's another. And then we had one where we didn't use the electrical resistivity log. We There are six different approaches that we used. And then that generated six models. And then we used the posterior sampling to generate a thousand models for every one of those six. And then what we were able to do is present not just here's the upper aquifer, here's the lower aquifer. What we do is then display, here's the probability of sand and gravel. And that's a very interesting way to display it. So given our 6,006 models, I said to the student, you should have done 5,094 and added. To, anyways, given our 6,006 models, then you can say, if you want to put a monitoring well in, and you want to be in a well-connected sand and gravel package, drill here. The last thing you want as a geophysicist is to pass over a model. And my best guess showed it sand and gravel. And they spent $100,000 in drill and hit clay. 
And I go, oh, there was actually 40% chance it could have been clay, but I showed you the most probable. If they knew there was a 40% chance of clay, they would not have spent their $100,000. <laughs> so that's how we're really using uncertainty now, recognizing that people want to use these data for, to take an action. Did you have a question, Zell? I'm still kind of coming up with it in my head, but thanks. Well, we are at the canonical hour. Um, if you have more questions, feel free to reach out to Rosemary individually. And let's all thank Rosemary once more for her wonderful presentation. And we will see you all next week. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, for setting it up. That was uh, great. Not at all. And let, let's definitely chat um, offline about the uncertainty stuff, because I'm actually using I've actually developed over the course of the past year um, an uncertainty quantification technique that basically just uses regularized inversion. So the, the exact setup that that you know um, Esben's group uses to do the the, the regularized inversions um, gives you can give you quantitative uncertainties like just sort of in the inversion process as you go. So right. you don't need any fancy like you know uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling or whatever. Um, yeah, so we didn't get into the Markov chain because it was just too computationally intensive. So I always stop. So we were Soggy Kang joined my group. He was worked with Doug Oldenburg for many years. And um, yeah, it's a difference in terminology, smallest smoothness. So I always go smallest smoothness talking to Soggy. Anyway, so that's what um, he's been doing a lot of that. And it's in this paper that just came out. Yeah, so uh, one thing you could really do, which is really cool though, is it, you sort of bypass the whole a computational bottleneck of doing MC MC, and you can get um, basically uncertainty on regularized inversion. It's something I've been working on with um, Steve and, and a, another guy here, Maddie Morrisville. Well, anyway, so we, we, 